Hello and, hello and welcome or welcome back to Mallory in the Library. Today we're going to read some stories about um, animals and pets and some are funny and some are serious but I think that you'll really enjoy what we're going to read today. The first one is called Thanks to the Animals by Alan Saka Basin who's a Pascamudi storyteller and it's illustrated by Rebecca Ray. Okay. Winter had arrived. Jutum worked for days preparing for the trip north with his family. He took apart their house near the shore and stacked the cedar logs on the big bobsled. Everyone helped. They packed the family sled with his tools and with the meats and fish and vegetables harvested during the summer when the days were long. It was loaded to the very top with precious food, but Ju Tum made sure there was room for his children to ride in the back. Everyone dressed in warm sealskin clothes for the long trip. It was time to go to their winter home in the deep woods. The horses pulled the sled slowly through the new snow. Zusap was not yet walking, but he was a strong baby born in the spring. He rode on the sled with the other children. As the shadows grew long, the older children slept. But then, little Zusap stood up and tumbled off the sled. Oh, how Zusap cried. His voice filled the sky. The animals of the forest were alerted by his crying. First to come were the beaver. They knew they had to keep him warm and dry, so they put their tails together and cradled Zusa. Zusa still cried. So, oh, did we miss someone? No. Zusa still cried. So the moose came, then the bear, then the caribou, and then the deer. The fox and the wolf came too, and all the big animals lay together in a circle. That sounds pretty cozy. Then the other, smaller animals came. The raccoons, porcupines, rabbits, weasels and mink, the muskrat and the otter and the squirrels and mice came too. They gathered and filled in the cracks between the big animals. At sunset, the owl came. Then the raven, crow, jay, duck, and a goose gathered to perch on top. Even a seagull came. Last came the great bald eagle, who spread her wings over all the other birds and animals, and Zusa stayed warm. When Jutum arrived at his winter home, he knew something was very wrong. Zusa was missing. Jutum quickly lit a fire for his family and got them settled. Then he returned back to the trail to find his son. He traveled through the woods all night and just at sunrise, he came to a big mound of snow. Resting on top was the great bald eagle.
I knew you would come back for Zusap, the eagle said. Jutum looked down and saw his son, safely sleeping in a pile of warm animals. Jutum thanked the animals one by one. Then he took Zusap in his strong arms and went back to the family. When they arrived that evening, there was feasting and dancing. What a celebration! And so then the author talks about why the family would have taken their house down at the summer place and moved on to the winter place. And it talks about how people did what's called migration. Um, you may have heard of different types of creatures doing this, but people do it too. And so people used to go all over the place, um, especially at the season, so they could go where they would be safe and warm in the winter and be cool in the summer and have lots of things to eat. And so that is that story. Next, we are going to read Night Song by Ari Burke and Lauren Long. It says, for my mother and my son, and then it says, to my father. The sun had set and the shadows uh, clinging to the walls of the cave began to wake and whisper. Chiro, little wing, the bat mother said to her child, tonight you must fly out into the world and I will wait here for you. But the night is dark, Mama, darker than the moth's dark eyes, darker even than the water before dawn, the little bat exclaimed, twitching his ears this way and that. I know, whispered his mother. And when it is that dark outside, I cannot always see, Chiro admitted, stretching his wings. There are other ways to see, she told him, other ways to help you make your way in the world. How? Use your good sense. What is sense? The little bat asked. His mother folded him in her wings and whispered into his waiting ears. Sense is the song you sing into the world and the song the world sings back to you. Sing and the world will answer. That is how you'll see. Now fly from our cave to the pond where we bats like best to eat. Have your breakfast, then fly home, but do not go farther than the pond unless your song is sure. And then she let him go. Chiro fell into the cold air for an instant, then flapped and turned and flew out past the mouth of the cave and into the waiting night. At first, Chiro tried to peer his way through the dark. Long arms rose up in front of him, waving slowly, blocking his path. He could not see around them or over them. Chiro was frightened. Hmm, maybe those could be tree branches. But he remembered his mother's bright words. Use your good sense. Chiro began to sing. Softly at first. Oh, look at what's happening over here. But then more surely, his song flew ahead of him and soon he could hear something singing back. Tall trees called out to him, chanted the length of their long branches and the girths of their rough, rough trunks. Gleefully, he flew through the woods, past pines, over maples, and away.
Flying higher now, Chiro saw something sliding through the sky towards him. So out went his song, and where danger once threatened, now Chiro saw only a flock of friends flying above him on their evening errands. As he flew further, Chiro heard strange sounds, lines of noise, a thousand voices buzzing from one end of the sky to the other. For just a moment, Chiro didn't know what to do or which way to go, but he followed his own song. In the sky behind him flowed a river of whispers fading away. The pond was just ahead. When Chiro came to the pond, singing still, he was very hungry. All the night creatures were there above the reeds, thousands of tiny, flying, tasty things, each one humming a different tune. For Chiro, each one of their songs sounded like breakfast. Chiro ate well that night. When he was full, he stretched his wings again and thought about flying home. But he began to wonder, just a little, what lay beyond the pond? What lay beyond his mother's words? So Chiro flew a bit farther and the familiar fell away from him. Out, out to the margins of the world, and then he was truly on his own. He flew fast towards a high dune, each grain of sand calling out in chorus as he passed. Chiro flapped up and over the top of the dune and out over the strand, singing louder than he ever sang before. Out went his song over dark water, then again and again, each wave on the ocean rising up to greet him, each splash of sea foam becoming kin to him. The sky began to change, grow light, and cast long shadows over the shore. With the morning came memory, his mother's voice, her warm wings. Shira knew it was time to go home. Flying higher than he'd ever flown, Chiro began to sing, listening, listening. The music of the land rose up in all of its many textures, each tree, each cliff, each place he'd passed, until finally, the song of home added its voice to the others. His cave crawled out from the blanketing shrubs and pillows of moss at its mouth, and Chiro followed that familiar sound back into the sheltering earth. His mother caught him all up in her wings and asked, Was it very dark in the world, little wing? What did you see? Mama, Chiro said laughing, it was very, very dark. And I saw everything. And then he yawned and turned his head into the warmth of her body, letting the rising sun's quiet song carry him, lull him, and sing him to sleep. And so what happened in the story, um, when Chira was using his song to sing is something very special that some animals do called echolocation. It means that they can know where they are because of the way their song sounds on different surfaces. Um, you may have noticed that in some places your voice sounds different. If you're in a small room or a big room or outside or inside or close to a wall or far away. And so bats are actually able to use that to uh, find out where they are, which is pretty amazing. Our next story is a funny story. It is called 
Cone Cat. It's written by Sarah Howden and illustrated by Carmen Mock. And I think you'll really like this one. One day, Jeremy woke up at the vets and there was the cone. Like a giant white bell, it bent his whiskers, blocked his view, and bungled his super cat senses. I am cone cat now, he told himself. I will never be the same. As Jeremy, he'd been nimble and quick, and he'd prided himself on his sweet scent. Now he was knocking into door jams and backing his way down the stairs with all the grace of a fat squirrel. He didn't smell so good either. Clearly the cone was winning. To take his mind off his problems, he tried to keep busy. Hunting, redecorating, and hiding from Ava, the little human but nothing could shake his feline funk until a change landed right in his lap. Well, in his cone. Ava had been eating breakfast as usual, fruity o's and milk, his favorite. And as always, he jumped on the table to lap up the leftovers. But this time, his tongue couldn't reach the bottom of the bowl. Come on, Cone, he said. Help me out. The Cone didn't answer. Then, something magical happened. Just as Cone Cat wilted like the saddest flower, the bowl tipped toward him. Milk and cereal poured into his mouth and into the cone, too. He could save some for later. Could the cone be a friend after all? It got even better. That spider he was stalking, it didn't taste as good as he had hoped. And the armchair unstuffing? Not a tough luck behind. Plus, if he directed the cone just so, he could hear Ava coming before she'd even left her room. All this led up to the greatest moment of Cone Cat's life. Ava's birthday party. Of course, a gathering of little humans can be a nightmare for a cat. But then came the cake, and with it, ice cream. Yes, the tall humans were serving ice cream in big dollopy scoops, strawberry sprinkle surprise flavor. The little humans all lined up with their bowls for the treat. Cone Cat drooled, inching his way closer. Was he seeing things? Or did those bowls look familiar? As the little humans spooned the stuff into their mouths like so much catnip, he pressed himself up to the front of the line and, oh, looks like he's almost ready. Plop. Before they could realize their mistake, Cone Cat tiptoed off to a quiet place and gobbled down the ice cream, licking up every last drop. It was heaven, and it never could have happened without the cone. The next day, Cone Cat felt one of the tall humans scratch scratching his neck. I hope they're not making you tighter, he thought. 
a cone? But suddenly, it was off. His head was free again. Goodbye, he thought as the human whisked the cone away. Goodbye forever. Of course, he was happy to be back to his normal self. Happy to be Jeremy again. But looking back, he wondered, Will anything ever compare to my glory days with the cone? It didn't take him long to find out. It looks like maybe he got hurt again. I hope that story made you laugh. And we have one more story for today. Um, so as we're coming into spring, you'll notice a lot of changes are happening. Things are going to get warmer and there's going to be all kinds of new things happening. And this book talks about some of those things. It's called Up in the Garden and Down in the Dirt by Kate Messner, and the art is by Christopher Silas Neal. It says, for the Burns family of gardeners, and for my lifelong garden companion, Jennifer. Up in the garden, I stand and plan, my hands full of seeds, and my head full of dreams. Spring sun shines down to melt the sleepy snow. Wind whistles through last year's plants and mud sucks at my rain boots. It's not quite time, Nana says. Down in the dirt, things need to dry out and warm up. What's down there, I ask. Down in the dirt is a whole busy world of earthworms and insects digging and building and stirring up soil. They are already working down in the dirt. Up in the garden, we snap brittle stalks, scoop rustly armfuls and wheel away weeds for the chickens. While they squabble and scratch, we spread compost over the soil. Down in the dirt, pill bugs chew through last year's leaves. I give a gentle poke. They roll up tight and hide in plated suits of armor. Rolly, poly, and round. Up in the garden, it's time to plant. I trail a furrow with my finger and sprinkle seeds in a careful row. Give them a drink, Nana says. We pat them down to snuggle in the dark. Down in the dirt, a tomato hornworm, hornworm rests, waiting for wings, and the leaves where she will lay her eggs. Up in the garden, carrot plants sprout, pea blossoms bloom, wasps are on the prowl, and honeybees visit, their legs loaded with pollen. I weed and wilt in sun so strong, even Nana looks for shade. Down in the dirt, earthworms tunnel deep, and jealous of their cool, damp dark. Up in the garden, rain shower, Nana turns the hose on me. Eee! I hide behind the cucumber vines, but their leaves can't save me. I shiver and laugh, drenched in Nana's rain. Down in the dirt, water soaks deep, roots drink it in, and a long-legged spider still walks over the streams. See him? Oh, there he is. Up in the garden, there's so much to eat. Ladybugs feast on aphids. Nana crunches green beans. I bite a ripe tomato warm from the sun. Juice dribbles down my chin.
Down in the dirt, a robin's beak finds a cricket, a beetle, a grub. Slugs are scrumptious, too. Up in the garden, we pick cukes and zucchini, harvesting into the dark. Bats swoop through the sunflowers, and I pluck June bugs from the basil until it's time for bed. Down in the dirt, skunks work the night shift. They sh snuffle and dig and gobble cutworms while I sleep. Up in the garden, a praying mantis wakes to hunt mosquitoes. Nana sprays away the aphids, and I'm after grasshoppers. Ready to swoosh, but... Snap! Someone else is faster. Down in the dirt, a smooth, shining garter snake crunches on supper. Up in the garden, the wind grows cool. Pumpkins blush orange and sunflowers bow to September. Nana ties them together to build a house for reading. Down in the dirt, an orb weaver spins her web strand by silken strand. She will munch on moths tonight. Up in the garden, colored leaves litter the squash vines, and we know the cold is coming. Hurry, hurry and harvest. There's enough for the neighbors too. Down in the dirt, frantic ants gather what we leave behind. They're storing food for cooler days ahead. Up in the garden, Frost draws lace on leftover leaves where secret egg sacs hang, waiting for the worm to return. We say goodbye and spread the winter blankets. Down in the dirt, beetles burrow, ants scurry home, and earthworms curl tight in the dark. When grandpa calls us in for soup, an autumn moon is rising. Up in the garden, dry corn stalks tremble and the wind smells like winter, but the long, ripe days of summer still rest in the garden beds. The ladybugs and bumblebees, earthworms and ants are hunkered down, hiding and biding their time. Dreaming of sunshine and blossoms and sprouts, under the bare arms of trees and the blanketing snow, a whole new garden sleeps down in the dirt. So I hope that you liked our stories today about animals and gardening um, and just about the world that we live in. And so I hope that you join us next week I'm not sure what type of stories we'll tell next week yet, but I know that they will be fun and I have a feeling you just might like them. So I will see you next week. Have a great week and stay warm and stay safe.